I still remember the first time I learned about planar homography, the topic of the previous section. Um, I was in grad school, and shortly after I learned about that, um, I took a trip to Egypt with my father, um, where I'm from originally. And we, we uh, went to, to Egypt quite often. Um, and uh, one of the places I really love in Egypt, this is Cairo up here, by the way, to orient you, the Mediterranean Sea up top and the Red Sea down here. And as you go down along the Nile, you end up in a place called Luxor, which is a truly remarkable place where many of the, the most gorgeous historical Egyptian monuments are. Pyramids are up top, and you should go see those, absolutely. But this is where all the magic is down in Luxor. And I remember going to Luxor and uh, visiting some of the tombs of the nobles and of the kings and of the queens. And one in particular was really spectacular. This was the tomb of Rahmi Ra. And what I'm showing you here is a floor plan of that tomb, which was really, truly amazing. Um, so this is a top view over here. You can see that the, it's a really long and very, very narrow um, uh, tomb. And then from the side plane down below, you can see it also increases in height as you go out. So this is a three-dimensional version of it. So imagine going into this, this thing that's basically seven feet or so wide, extremely long, and then um, angling upwards. And one of the things we do when we go there is we like to take photographs. Um, and uh, this, for example, is a photograph from the tomb. And you can see, first of all, simply spectacular that this thing is thousands of years old and retains this kind of fidelity and color um, despite the thousands of years from when it was first uh, built and decorated. Um, but think about how to photograph this. This is near the end of the wall. I only can move back seven feet and I've got something that is 20 feet up. And so what do I do? I take my camera and I tilt it upwards and I take a picture. And what am I seeing is, well, that wasn't my sensation when I was in the room. And the reason I'm seeing this, of course, is because of the perspective distortion. Um, I am, my camera sensor is tilted relative to the surface. Now, if I had a ladder and I can go straight up and look directly in so that my optical axis is perpendicular to the wall, I would have a fully undistorted image. But I don't. And so when I was taking photographs in here, all the images just looked terrible like this because I just couldn't get far enough back and I didn't have a wide enough field of view. And I remember being on the plane, returning back from Cairo back to, to New York, and my father asked me, you know, you're the computer scientist, you're the guy who does digital imaging. Why can't we do something about this? Why can't we make better pictures digitally in post? And I remember thinking to myself, well, I think he's right. And of course, I thought, well, that's a planar surface. And I had just learned about planar hermography. And I thought, well, I wonder if we could apply it here. Now, you know, it's not as simple as a license plate with a two to one ratio, but I do know something about uh, the, the shapes in these things, um, about how wide and how tall they are just from the documentation in the Egyptology literature. And so what I did is I went to all the pictures that I'd taken, I'd found little segments where I knew something about the aspect ratio, and each of those images, I applied a planar homography. And the result was, by doing that over and over and over again for each of the images that I took, heavily, heavily distorted, we were able to start to reconstruct the entire wall as if I was able to move really far away and look directly at the wall with no distortion. And so this is a really beautiful example of using planar homography and then a little bit of uh, compositing techniques for how to stitch the images together in order to create this type of mosaic. And I just wanted to mention this because it's a particularly, I thought, nice application of using the homography to remove distortion. Let me show you a couple more examples of this. Um, this was also part of the same trip. Um, this was a, a beautiful obelisk um, of Ramses II. You can see that I've taken this in a series of photographs, one, two, three, four, five photographs. And this little dark area that you see here is just the overlap where I've overlaid them. And so Matt, this thing is huge. I forget exactly how tall. It's, I think, 80 feet tall. And I'm on the floor, of course. And so when I'm looking at the base in this bottom photo over here, I've got more or less a direct view of it. But what's happening is, I'm rota is I need to photograph upwards. I can't take the camera and keep moving it up 80 feet. So what do I do? I tilt the camera, I tilt the camera, I tilt the camera, and I tilt the camera. And what that means is at the top here, there's compression. There's perspective distortion. 
That is not what it looks like because I am imaging at an angle relative to the one down below. And so this is a highly, not highly, but distorted image. And we thought, well, could we do something here? I actually know quite a bit about the size of this thing. So we take these five individual photographs, we composite them together. So I'm gonna remove the overlap now. Again, still distorted. And now I'm going to apply the planar homography. So let's see what that looks like. Ah, look at that. So now look at what happens to the top. Look, this is now a true rendering of the scene. Not a huge difference, but not an insignificant difference. Um, if you want to actually document what is going on. By the way, just to show off, I actually wanted to show you what the resolution of this thing looks like. Uh, this is just one of the cartouches, cartouches showing the name of Ramses in the photograph and now has true fidelity. All right, so for consumer, for you know, the average photograph, who cares that there's distortion? But if you really want to make measurements and document things from a historical perspective, these types of, of distortion corrections are incredibly important. It's part of the same trip where we photographed Rachmi Ra and Ramses's uh, obelisk. We also visited this beautiful tomb of Senegem. And unlike the royals, Rachmiran and, and uh, Ramses, Senegem was a nobleman. And so the tombs were a little more modest but no less beautiful. Um, this is a particularly beautiful tomb where I'm standing at one end photographing the other and then uh, vice versa. And this tomb is really compact. It is five meters by two and a half meters by two and a half meters. And is very, very challenging to photograph in. In addition to being um, very compact, you also see that we have the addition of this curved ceiling here. And so imagine me inside of this tiny little tomb, crunched down in the corner, looking up in that beautifully decorated ceiling and trying to take a picture. And the resulting photograph looks something like this and this. So these are two neighboring panels on the ceiling. Notice that this part here that shows Senegem giving thanks to the gods and then that white hieroglyph strip going down is the same as that right there. So these two um, are the same region and I'm just sliding down taking photographs. And here you see a similar but dissimilar type of distortion that we saw with the planar surfaces of the no parking sign, the license plate, the obelisk, and the Rachmi Ra tomb. Here what you're seeing is a curvature. Now, it'd be nice if the homography worked here, but it doesn't. And let's first make sure we understand why that is. Remember that how we got to the homography is that we said when you have a planar world surface, um, you can define the world coordinate system, and we define it so that the x, y is in plane, z is coming out of plane, and that z coordinate is zero. That collapses the extrinsic matrix from a three by four to a three by three matrix, which is invertible, which is why we can estimate the homography and remove the distortion. Imagine this curved surface. Put a world coordinate system anywhere on that curved surface, and all of the z's corresponding to that surface will not be zero. And so although this is a non-linear two-dimensional surface, this curvature, it is not planar. And so the rules of homography don't apply. And if we wanted to, for example, create the same type of mosaic or composite that we did for the previous two examples, we're sort of in trouble. Now, I'm not going to show you exactly how I did this because the underlying technique is, is not sort of relevant here, but I just wanted to show you some of the things that you can do when you can in fact start to remove world distortions. And so what I did here is I've, I've um, highlighted the yellow dots along that what should be a rectilinear hieroglyphic strips on the ceilings. And if I assume that those should be rectilinear, I'm going to model the distortion not as a homography, but using a parabolic surface. And I don't know exactly that it's parabolic inside that tomb, but it's roughly parabolic. And it turns out, I'm not gonna talk about exactly how we um, uh, did the estimation. Um, we'll talk about that later on in the semester. But once you have an estimate of what the geometry is, then you can remove the distortion. Now, this is similar to the homography in that I've estimated the distortion and I've removed the distortion. It's just the distortion now is a parabolic distortion versus a planar distortion. And look what happened from the top to the bottom is now rectilinear lines are rectilinear um, in the undistorted view. And now notice that that overlap in the image actually looks like overlap because now they look very similar, which means I can start to stitch 
these two things together and do something like that right there. So this is now a stitched version of this version here where I've also done some lighting um, and a correction to get the balancing uh, just right and a little bit of contrast enhancement using a simple uh, sigmoidal linear, a uh, sigmoidal lookup table. Now, if I repeat this process over and over and over again throughout the tomb, I get something that looks like this. It's just if I, it's just if I, I was a giant and I went into that tomb and I ripped open the ceiling, opened up the whole tomb, stepped back with a high resolution camera and took a picture and I have this fully undistorted view. Here are the ceilings from um, one side, the ceiling from the other side. Those are the two panels you saw below. This is what was below. Uh, this gap right here is the door um, where you enter into the tomb. And these are the two ends that we saw earlier from the original photograph. And now you can see you get a very different view in this mosaic of the Egyptian tomb than you would from these little snippets of the tomb, highly, highly distorted. And just to show you what this looks like, this is one of the walls. Again, that's the door and the gap that you see here. Um, and you can see the beautiful uh, decorations inside of the tomb. This is the second wall um, and higher resolution. And now we can return back to the two end walls. And now I can do something even cooler than just, hey, here's an unfolded version of the surface and I can study it and analyze it and make measurements and reason about what's happening throughout the tomb. But I can start to do a full-blown 3D reconstructions because remember, I know the geometry of the tomb. I know it's five by two and a half by two and a half. And now I know in an undistorted coordinate system, what the world should look like. So I can take those undistorted images that I just showed you, texture map them back onto this three-dimensional model, and then I can do something like a full-blown three-dimensional virtual walkthrough of this structure, which you're about to see right now. So here what I've done is I've taken that geometry, I've texture mapped the undistorted image, why undistorted? Well, of course, if I put the distorted image onto the geometry, I get a double distortion. So I have to know what that undistorted view looks like so that when I put it back onto this curved surface, it actually looks right. And now I can do virtual walkthroughs um, of these beautiful ancient Egyptian tombs in a way that a single photograph simply can't capture. And all that was really required here was just taking that planar homography idea and extending it out um, slightly to have a slightly more complex uh, geometric shape. And again, I haven't talked about the details of that. You'll see it, you'll have a link uh, to the paper that describes all of this. And we'll talk about the underlying techniques later on in the semester. I hope that you've seen the, the, this part of the, the lecture is really just to show you some of the power of these techniques. We saw forensic applications trying to read a license plate that is heavily distorted and some more creative and historic and architectural examples where you can start to reconstruct the three-dimensional world, in some cases the two-dimensional world from image, which of course underlies so much of computer vision.